So there is this, there's this, obviously, a longevity, but there's a brilliance to stories like Christmas and stories like Easter that center around the circumstances, uh, the depiction of that which is the master teacher, Jesus, that is offered to us in Scripture. Um, I, I say brilliance because what it does is, is it showcases this individual and his actions and his commitment and his belief he had a busy life, but he took the time to show up. Uh, and it created a template. And what I mean by that, it, 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 it gave us the possibility of to, to take the template and the actions of what it is that he displayed in order for us to own that and to begin to embark on creating that same template for our own individual lives to this day. Um, it is often said that Jesus is not the great exception, that Jesus is, in fact, the great example. And when you understand the difference of that, then you can really appreciate the scripture that is found in the book of John when he uttered these words and he said, yes, great things have I done, but greater things shall ye do. So right then and there, you understand that there is no separation between who this individual was and the consciousness that this individual operated from and from who you are. It really is a to-the-degree level of ownership, willingness, dedication, and practice. And what better example of practice than this particular man's life? And the, the, the holiday or the, the, the season or the, the festivity that we celebrate today known as Easter is really one simple thing, and it's about the fact that death in and of itself is an illusion. And we've often talked about the fact that death and how we define death is really human-made. It's a concept born of humans that has finality to it, that has some kind of uh, end nature. And a lot of us have taken that human definition and we have created mountains and mountains of fear. Mountains of fear. And so fear can actually be a pretty, pretty decent motivator. And so my question to you today is what moderates or motivates your behavior? And you have all the, the permission in the world to modify and moderate your behavior out of fear, or you have the availability to modify or moderate your behavior out of a livingness, an eternal livingness. And what implications does that have? It has a lot then to do with the way in which you do life and how you show up. There's so many people who are so, so way ahead of the idea of what's going to happen to me when I die. Not only where am I going to go, but who's going to take care of this? Who will remember me? What kind of legacy can I leave? And a lot of times, this idea of who will remember me and what legacy will I leave is actually born from ego. Because we're not even here, why does it matter? But we think it will matter. And think about it. So in this lifetime, we're so concerned about how we'll be remembered that we're actually not in the present moment doing our thing. It's like, how can I create my legacy? Enough of that. So what moderates your behavior now? The fear of dying or the infinite possibility within life? And to me, that is the essence of what Easter is. That you and I get to continually examine that. It's no accident that these stories, and Easter is not just found in the Christian tradition. <laughs> that whole birth and re resurrection, uh, crucifixion, resurrection thing is consistently happening through all different varying religions around the world. And it's an annual thing that gets to be revisited just like our lives. And so here we are. We are here to relearn how to live. Can you imagine you forgot how to live? And so this morning, we're going to relearn how to live. So the most powerful scripture to me was that one in John that said, Verily I say unto you, greater things, greater things have I done. Can you imagine him? He's like, yeah, I've done some pretty cool stuff. But guess what? You are so awesome. That's the new teenage version edition. <laughs> but you are like so off the chain uh, that you can do these things too. 
greater things, greater things shall ye do. So my question to you is, how are you doing with that? How are you doing with those greater things? And in your own life path and in the way in which you're expressing them. How are you rising above the death cycles that present themselves to us daily? How are you doing with that? How are you showing up your true nature, offering that essence to you? One of the greatest uh, lessons that was offered to me was through a spiritual mentor of mine was right before I was about to leave for Spain to walk the Camino, he said, by the way, you're going to die. He paused and I went, what? <laughs> many deaths. I was like, oh, whew, okay. <laughs> you're going to die many deaths, meaning that this pilgrimage that you're about to embark on is going to bring up your stuff. And when it brings up your stuff, you have an option. You either get to stay in the fear of that stuff or you get to die to the fear of that stuff so that you can come out and be born on the other side so that there can be a resurrection of sorts. And so when I look at that charge to us, I say the same thing to you. You're going to die many deaths. And what I want you to do is I want you to embrace that. So this is a very odd Easter story today. Because typically it's about, you're risen. No, today you're going to die. You're going <laughs> to die many deaths. And this is a good thing. It's a good thing. So the first death, the first death to me is a daily death. And it's the death of comparison. The death of comparison. Living life as a, as a measuring stick. And I say daily because I don't know about you, but isn't that in your face constantly? When you look at other people, when you measure up your quote, quote, success, what is success, truly? But we have defined success by looking at other people, by comparing ourselves to them, by the way that they dress, the, the, the way your, your family dynamic is, from where you're from, your breeding, all of these kinds of things, how, whether we were successful in creating our, and, and living our life from our passion, or whether we feel we sold out, we're constantly comparing and there is this thing that I heard when I was a little kid trying to learn how to build things. And maybe you heard this too. It was called measure twice, cut once. Did you ever hear that? Measure twice, cut once. And that's really great for construction. However, when you are building a life, when you are building a life, if you measure yourself even once against anyone else, you do cut twice. You cut yourself and you cut them because you create some semblance of separation between the two of them. I can't tell you how liberating it can be for you if you are just simply willing to die to the death of comparison. And it just doesn't seem that that's something that just comes readily available to us right out of the starting gate. That is a lifelong process of being committed, of, of owning that particular behavior, of noticing it as it's happening, and being willing to do something about it. For me, the greatest thing was the realization that my, my purpose here in this go-around is to not be dependent upon outside validation. The moment that you are dependent upon outside validation is the moment that that poison of comparison just begins to flow through your veins. And so, the death of comparison. The other one is the death of our limiting perceptions. Every day, we are perceiving things from our own level of consciousness. I could line up a whole bunch of you up here. You would all have varying degrees of consciousness. We would all tell one story, and every single different because every single story would be delivered from the platform of your sense of awareness and that is what perception is and if you and I are willing to die daily to our personal perceptions and to realize that they're very finite in nature then what we do is we open ourselves up to rediscover a deeper truth it's fascinating because when you are bogged down by history then you will carry that history into your generation and deliver it to the next generation to come. But if you sever, if you sever that historical aspect of whatever that is, 
and decide to live your life and create a new sense of perception and a new sense of identity for who you are, then you move greater and greater into the reality of what it is that the master teacher Jesus was here for us to offer. For example, in this story, if you remember, he was forced to carry this massive cross on his shoulder. And the path that he walked down was called the Via Della Rosa. Now, I've never been to Jerusalem, but the Via Della Rosa is still very much there. It's a, it's an, a system of alleyways. And uh, if you are a Reformed Catholic, you know that the stations of the cross have to do with the passage of Jesus going down the Via Della Rosa. So there were many things they said that happened which then culminate into the stations of the cross. There were three times when he stumbled. There was once when he was spat upon, when he was cursed. There was once when his mother Mary reached out to wipe his brow. All of these times as he was carrying this thing to his own execution. If you did not know any of that and you were on vacation in Jerusalem, and you were just strolling down this beautiful street, you would say, my, what a beautiful street. Until someone said, no, 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 this is the path of pain. And then you would look around and you would go, oh. (laughs) And a new sense of perception would come down into you, and you would accept that this was the path of pain. That's not to be disrespectful for the the history behind the Via Della Rosa, but it is to show you an example of when you don't know and when you don't accept somebody else's definition of something. Then you are free to define and create your own. But the moment that you accept what somebody else has defined is the moment that you become locked into that definition. Let's say you knew nothing about World War II and you went to Japan, and you went to the city of Hiroshima. And as you were walking around, you had no idea that that very city was where the first atomic bomb landed, killing hundreds of thousands of people almost in an instant, decimating, decimating miles and miles of life. And yet it goes to show you the regeneration power of life. Just like Easter shows us the regeneration power of life. If you did not know that, you would find yourself in a thriving urban city with trees and cherry blossoms blowing and businesses and people walking the streets. You would have no idea that in 1945, all of that was instantly wiped away. And so how does that then translate to you and to your life? What have you accepted as your your confinement? Or this is the best that it will ever be. This is what someone else has perceived for me, so I'm accepting this. And so the idea of dying to that perception is so that you can be born into defining what is true for you. Does that make sense? So the crucifixions of our perceptions are powerful moments that change the entire course of our life path. You can call it a paradigm shift. You could call it a a reawakening. You could call it an aha moment. It alters. It literally alters the graph of your development in ways that no other possibility could up until that present moment. If you had an aha moment or a paradigm shift it's, and, and you were going to chart it, it would be like there would be this spike, this spike of awareness. And I love my friend Chelly Campbell in California because she says, you know what my definition of an aha moment is? She says it's when someone has heard something for the thousandth time. Because if everything has already been created and delivered ad nauseum to us, it's just that finally, finally, we were able to hear it and to perceive it. And so the death of the perception. The next is the death to ignorance. It's a fascinating word, ignorance. If somebody were to call you ignorant, boy, that would have a kind of a charge to it, right? But look at the root of that word. It's a combination of Latin and French, which comes from ignore, which means to simply ignore. So someone who is actually ignorant of something 
has done what? They've simply ignored the value or the information or the lesson that is being given to them. And so death to ignorance means that for once and for all, our, we are willing to be hyper-aware of the good that is around us rather than ignoring it. So let me just tell you right here, we are all ignorant at times. Ooh, there's a happy Easter message for you, <laughs> right? We are all operating in ignorance when we ignore when we ignore the infinite possibility of everything that is around us, when we ignore the fact that every 24-hour capsule that we call a day offers us infinite potentiality, when we are ignoring that, then, my friend, there's no other way to put it, you and I are ignorant. And so death to ignorance means wake up. It means wake up. It means is st stop talking about a spiritual practice and cultivate a practice. Cultivate a practice that is make, going to assist you or make you become more aware. How else are you and I going to do that unless we choose to participate? Because remember, all, everything, all solution, all beauty, all life has already been created. What you and I do is we simply uncover that. We can uncover it or we can ignore it. The other one is the death to the false idea that anything really is a problem. What is the definition of a problem? If you say, I have a problem, what are you saying? You are saying, in essence, that I have distanced myself or I am separate from that which is God. Because if it's all God, see, that's the tricky thing we keep going back to, right? It's all God. Ah! Except for this one thing, you yeah? know? No. Yeah, there was no books called It's All God except for this one thing. It's all God. So if it's all God, then there cannot truly be a problem. There can only be or an ignorance or a choice by which we have labeled it that. And so what that calls for us to do then is to look at our fight, flight, or transcendent component. So I wrote problems. You run. And in your running, you feel a temporary assurance that all this fear will stay locked in some distant room whose door you will never have to open. You fight. And in your fighting, you feel that if you can just be louder stronger, more long-standing in your aggression, that the possibility of something or someone defeating you can be delayed. You stay. And in your staying, you uncover an internal creative power that has waited in anticipation for your recognition. You are reminded that fear will travel with you regardless how far you run. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. You are reminded that fear will travel with you regardless of how far you run. How many of you have tried to run? Some of you are telling the truth. <laughs> fear will travel with you regardless of how far you try to run. You are reminded that in your resistance and in your fighting, you only enlarge the force you choose to battle. In your staying, you bravely let go of the crippling pattern of fearful avoidance and blaming others. You dissolve the belief that anything outside may harm or diminish you. And now, now you are clear. Fear, then, is a choice. There is no us and them there is no problem. There is only our perception of the world waiting to be changed. And so as we look at this famous story, and we look at all of the components, we look at the betrayal, we look at the pathway of pain of the Via Della Rosa, we look at the crucifixion in and of itself, we are often told, too, that, you know, Jesus, 
He was, he's living a human life. He felt all human emotion. So even in, even in, in his consciousness, in knowing that, that death was an illusion, there was still that moment when he said, ooh, if you could take this cup, let it pass from me, that would be all right too. How many of us have been there? Ooh, this looks like a problem. This looks like a problem. If you could just maybe do it to somebody else. And yet, for me, the greatest thing, the greatest element of this amazing you could call it an allegory, or you could call it a story, or you could believe in it 100%. It does not matter. All you have to understand is all of the components are the components of your life. And it's not a one-time thing. It's a constant thing. So here to me is the most beautiful part, the tomb. And I think that we've only looked at one aspect of the tomb, and it's how do I get out of here? But today, what I want to leave you with is, this is a pretty cool tomb. Because when you go into the tomb, when you go into the tomb, when you go into it unreluctantly, that means that you already know, you already know that you're going to rise up. So then the tomb in and of itself is not, a, is not a death sentence. It's not a confinement. Sometimes what a tomb is, is it's a time out. Sometimes what a tomb is, it's, it's, it's a getting quiet. Sometimes what a tomb is, is the dark night of the soul. Sometimes what a tomb is, is an opportunity for you to step into the mystery, what sometimes we would call the darkness, the unknown territory, but you do it unreluctantly because you know what? You're going to go and you're going to rise up out of whatever is the next level of experience. So the tomb then, there's no judgment on it. There's no fear of it. So you said, take me. Let me walk right in. I'm not much of a tomb person, but I love caves. I love caves and the exploration of caves. So I changed the word from tomb to cave. And here's what I came up with. You must walk into the cave unreluctant. And as you enter, your eyes will momentarily enter darkness, yet it is your heart that will see. It is your heart that will beat with signals of illumination, shedding light for your yet-to-be steps. You must walk into the cave unreluctant. And at first, you will doubt your ability to navigate the jagged twist and the unknown turns that await. Yet, by the simple act of entering, your instincts reawaken. And you are welcomed home to an ancient wisdom that is nestled patiently within your heart. You must walk into the cave unreluctant. And for those beginning moments, you feel tense and fearful about the unknown losses that you feel await you in the mystery. But do you turn around and return to what is familiar? Or do you challenge that fearful impulse and then align with the inward will that will not cease its calling? You must walk into the cave unreluctant. And in those beginning steps, you revisit all of this lifelong evidence that you've built against yourself as to why you cannot succeed. But the deeper into the cave that you travel, the further removed those stories become. And a new story is established with each soldiering step and it reads of how you are far more capable than you've ever given yourself credit to be. 
You must walk into the cave unreluctant. If for no other reason than the fact that you don't want to. You must walk into the resistance. You must walk into the discomfort. You must lean into the darkness, the doubt, the mystery, for this is where you come to find that the true realization of this infinite life was never to be realized in the communes of conformity and the routine where all of the asleep people take shelter. No real infinite life. Infinite life. Life. Resurrection. Your resurrection only happens when you walk into the cave unreluctant. So it was the poet Robert Frost that said, the best way out is always through. And so this Easter, my message for you is, it's time to die many deaths because you got work to do. And until you and I are willing to walk into the cave of the mystery, until we are willing to die the deaths of all of that egoic, Crap. I had to censor my word there for a minute. All of that stuff. It's Easter. I can't talk that way. Uh, Until you are willing to die to that, don't you get that we never then fully live? And so the template, the example that was established by the master teacher Jesus is the template that goes and beckons and calls to you to live. And so as you close your eyes this morning, we stand before this seeming darkness, this cave, this mystery, this unknown. We stand there and we actually pause for a moment and we see how do we feel? Because there's something about that mystery and that unknown that is beckoning us. And for far too long, we have relied on other people's opinion. For far too long, we have actually sought out advice from others rather than simply standing in our own power and listening, heeding our own intuition, our own intelligence, our own wisdom that is inside of us. And so it is that wisdom that says, come, walk into this cave unreluctantly. Walk into the unknown, into the mystery. And I will tell you that by doing this, you will discover a quality of life that you didn't even realize existed. We have no idea of the bondage that we have put upon ourselves. And as we begin to die to the bondage of comparison and of our ignorance and of our limiting perceptions, We take one step further and one step further and one step further into this unknown. And the paradigm shift is this isn't darkness at all. Because what I have done by entering into this place is I have brought the light. I am the light. I am the life. I am the way. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves repeating the words of every master that has ever walked before us. And we realize that the I am is us. And so the rising up that takes place is the rising up within our consciousness of realizing the power of who and what we are. And no matter how many times we talk about it, no matter how many times we study it, we have to get our intellect out of the way so that our heart can finally have room to breathe, to beat, 
to shine, to lead. For it is the place that knows. And so our Easter today is a beautiful one of dying. Of dying to all the limiting beliefs. And really starting to finally live. And so I know this today for each of us, that starting to live is something that has been calling us and beckoning us every single day we have walked this planet. And it doesn't matter how old we are, what our story is, what condition we find ourselves in. It is calling us to live. So however much time we've got left, let's live. Let us walk into the cave unreluctant and know that by doing so, we bring the power. As we accept this now individually and collectively, as we accept this for our community, as this light now permeates not just from this physical building, but it permeates to anyone watching, it permeates to everyone who tunes in later, it permeates throughout this beautiful city of Atlanta, it permeates through the state, it permeates through our country and into our world because it cannot be confined. And that is the ultimate resurrection. Allowing this to be our truth right here and right now. We simply breathe in and just by breathing in, we say yes. Just by breathing in right now, we fill every cell, every organ, every tissue with permission, permission to see, to own, to know who and what we are. And for this, we are eternally grateful. And together we say, and so it is.